shot, thanks. Yeah, well, I was actually serving in the Army Reserve, um, two commando company, one commando regiment, and one of the guys I was serving with um, actually gave me a copy of Lex McCauley's book, um, The Battle of Long Tan, and I uh, wasn't really big on reading back then because I was pretty young, but um, I actually couldn't put this book down, and after I read it, uh, I was just really angry that I'd never learnt anything about this story, nothing about the Vietnam War, and kind of just stuck with me for, you know, the next 25 years. Yeah, well, I just saw an article in the paper that the commanders, the long tan commanders, were releasing their own book, um, and I just thought to myself, why is still nobody, you know, told this story, or why isn't it more well known? So, I didn't think much about it. Went to bed. I'm not spiritual at all, but I just had this very vivid dream that um, I actually was up on stage winning an award for a film on the Battle of Long Tan, and then I actually gave the award to Harry Smith, who commanded Delta Company Six RR in the battle. Um, and when I woke up, it was just very, very vi vivid, you know, and um, I sort of resolved that that day that if I don't kind of get up off my ass um, and tell the story, nobody else will. So that's where it all started. Yeah, well, uh, the first thing I thought of is, um, you know, who's going to want to, you know, fund or commission this documentary um, and Foxtel were doing quite a lot um, particularly the History Channel you know their factuals um, department so um, I knew Brian Walsh no relation um, who basically runs Foxtel um, and pitched the idea that you know the 40th anniversary is coming up it would be great to actually you know tell the story and really kind of change start to change the narrative around the the Anzacs you know which is predominantly being World War One so yeah, so pitched that and uh, a few months later put, put that into production. Um, it was a mad rush um, to actually get it made in time for the 40th anniversary. Um, you know, East Timor broke out a week before we started filming the doco, so we actually lost the APCs and the Huey Choppers. Um, so that, that was quite a, quite a um, dramatic moment in, in, in that process, but we managed to, you know, resolve that. Um, and I got Sam Worthington because I actually went to a, a premiere of Somersault, um, and Sam was starring in um, Somersault and I uh, went, you know, the Q&A afterwards and I just saw him on stage speaking with uh, the director and the rest of the cast and just the way he was speaking was very, very plainly Australian um, and it just stuck with me, you know, for the next year until I actually started to, to do the documentary that he would be the perfect person um, to narrate it in the first person. I wanted to make a film before I did the documentary, but because I'm a marketer by profession, nobody knew or remembered about Long Tan in 2004. So that was part of the strategy of make the documentary, start to build awareness, um, and then build eventual interest in, in a feature film. Um, so I actually commissioned um, some guys locally, um, the story shop in Sydney, who were very... Um, uh, they had a great methodology around um, sort of creating um, a, a script, um, you know, the actual process of developing the script. So I commissioned them to write a treatment, then an outline, then we did a first draft script. Um, and then with that first draft, um, I'd actually just seen Red Dog uh, and thought that, um, you know, everything about it was just great. You know, the cinematography, the casting. And so, you know, I called his agent and um, sent the script and literally within 24 hours, you know, um, Ed Wiener, Kreef Stenner's agent, um, came back and said, yeah, Kreef loves it and, you know, would definitely, wants to have a, a talk with you and meet with you. And, and then through that process, um, it just so happens that my producing partners, John and Michael Schwartz, were talking to Kreef Stenner's about an entirely different project. Uh, they were producing films with Sam Worthington. Um, and clearly Sam knew a lot about the project and they knew a little bit about it, but they ended up talking more about this project than the other project that they were pitching to Creve. So, um, so it kind of started, started from there and then, then we got Stuart, Stuart Beattie. Um, so John and Michael, my producing partners, were doing Deadline Gallipoli for Foxtel. Um, and Stuart Beatty was writing one of those episodes and we knew that the script that we had needed a significant uh, polish or, or a rewrite. Um, so we approached Stu and then coincidentally Stu said he'd been thinking about writing <laughs> a, a script on the story of Long Tan for the past 10 years. So he already knew the subject matter, um, you know, people might believe in fate, um, I, I do sometimes, but that was definitely fate. 
Um, and then he quickly wrote an amazing script while he was actually doing post-production on, on his film, I Frankenstein, which he wrote and directed. There are so many freakish things on this project, <laughs> um, you know, like uh, one degree of separation, but, um, you know, to find a script writer of his calibre, and we do have a script writing, you know, challenge in Australia, but to find someone of his calibre that actually already knew about the story and then thirdly actually wanted to do it um, and do it in a way that we could actually make the film, um, you know, because Stuart's a, a tier one, you know, script writer in Hollywood. Um, so the fact that he came on board um, was just brilliant. That, that, so, you know, working with Creve and um, Stu, you know, we ended up with, um, you know, just a, an unbelievable script. Yeah, well, I think it's, um, it, it, it's a true underdog story in the sense of like 300 Spartans. You know, I mean, you've got, um, the, the way I describe it, it's the true story of ordinary boys who became extraordinary men. You know, they were just ordinary, everyday Australians and, and New Zealanders. Half of them were conscripts. Um, you know, one of them, Gordon Sharp, who was the platoon commander, was a cameraman of, on the Mavis Bramston TV show, which actually won the Gold Logie that year. So suddenly, you know, he's ripped out of that world, he's put into Vietnam, and he's killed in Vietnam all at the age of 21. So it, it is a true story of um, brotherhood, love, um, you know, tragedy, um, and, and genuinely mateship. You know, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people and after they've read the script or read about the story, particularly Americans and particularly English and, and um, you know, Germans and Dutch, they said they never understood what the word mateship meant until they watched my documentary or ha had read the book. Um, so, and, and the other important thing for me is it is modernizing that ANZAC narrative. You know, I mean, I, f I think it's very important for us to create our new myths and legends. Um, we need to immortalize the, the Vietnam generation because certainly the US, you know, has immortalized them um, and, and that generation, um, but we haven't done that in Australia. And yet that period of our history was the most socially defining period of Australian contemporary history. Um, but again, we just haven't recognised, we haven't modernised and we, we kind of haven't attempted to tie a little bit of a bow, you know, around that period of our history, which is always important for future history. Because, you know, if we don't understand um, why we went there or why we shouldn't have gone there, we haven't properly debated it. You know, we haven't honoured, you know, those, those families that made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, we don't learn for the future. Um, he, Creve is incredible, you know. I mean, Creve is just such a collaborative, you know, calm but nervous at the same time. I mean, I think he's chewed through like a hundred straws or pencils or pens because um, he, he sort of channels all of that nervous um, energy and um, I suppose, um, you know, just tenseness in, into that pen. Um, and none of that has been experienced by the crew. I mean, he's totally collaborative. I mean, that the three amigos, I call them, <laughs> um, Creve Stenders, our director, uh, Ben Knott, our director of photography, and Jamie Leslie, our first AD, um, they hadn't actually worked together before. So as producers, you're always, you know, a little bit nervous. Um, but they have done the most incredible job um, telling the story, managing an amazing crew, managing a huge cast, um, a huge repertoire of extras, um, incredible locations. You know, they've nailed the schedule every day um, when everyone said we wouldn't even be able to make the film, you know, within our budget and our schedule. Um, but we've literally dropped one scene on one day, which we immediately picked up the next day. On another day, we brought two scenes forward because it was a threat of rain, but it never ended up raining. <laughs> so um, the weather gods have been very kind, but um, I, I can't tell you how incredible they've been. You know, the, the love, the attention, the enthusiasm, um, you know, and even the preparation. I mean, two days before we started filming, Creve said he didn't know what to do. He's like, he was nervous because he had actually had nothing to do a couple of weeks before we started filming um, because the preparation, you know, was just so incredible on this film. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, a key thing for me was um, how can we involve young Australian veterans in the making of the film? 
um, a lot of young veterans struggle with um, you know issues PTSD and, and other issues you know post their service um, particularly Iraq Afghanistan uh, East Timor Somalia veterans um, and you know, it's like any young Australian male or, or any, you know, young Australian, um, including female veterans, if you ask them, um, you know, are you okay or do you need a hand? They'll just say, no, I'm, I'm okay, mate. You know, but if you ask them to actually come and help participate in making a film about a battle that's part of their heritage, it's their legacy, um, immediately jumped off the couch and how can we help? Um, and that was important for me because I wanted the crew and I wanted Creve and our heads of department, our first AD, um, even our back office team to really understand what this film's about. We're not making a film about a fictional story. You know, this is about real people, real veterans, you know, real families. Um, and I wanted them to really understand that. Um, and the best way to do that is to have them work on the film and help build that culture of um, you know, care, love, attention, um, respect, um, and at the same time, expose them to an industry that could benefit them, you know, because there are a lot of great stories and there are a lot of creative people and they're not the stereotype, you know, that peop some people imagine them to be. So having them around has just completely changed the dynamic on this film um, in, in, a, in an unbelievably positive way. Um, you know, we organised for the real Delta Company 6RAR who deploy to Afghanistan in about a week's time to actually meet the cast. Um, no producers, no directors, n nothing. Um, and they went to a pub halfway between you know, Brisbane and um, Gold Coast and they just had the most incredible night. Um, they immediately gravitated to the roles that they were playing, like the same rank. It was really weird, <laughs> I, I was told afterwards. Um, but we've had lots of those, you know, on weekends, you know, the cast and the crew have caught up with some of those veterans at RSLs and we've listened intently to their stories. Um, they've shared things with us that they haven't even shared with their family. Um, and that's really opened up the eyes of our extras and our cast, um, you know, into what they would actually be feeling, you know, when they've seen one of their mates killed in front of them or, or wounded or, you know, being in a situation of running out of ammunition, but there's a never-ending supply of enemy, you know, attacking you. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's their legacy, it's their history, and for them to be able to talk to their families and future generations of their families and say, I just had a small part in this film, um, that that means a lot to me. Yeah, yeah, well quite a few of the, um, the cast in particular actually wanted to meet their living contemporaries. Um, so, you know, um, we, Travis Fimmel met Harry Smith who was playing uh, on Anzac Day before we even started shooting up at Rouen. Um, you know, Stephen Peacock met Adrian Roberts um, who, who commanded the armoured personnel carriers um, in Canberra. Um, you know, um, Lazarus Ratui's met um, Buddy Lee's, you know, son. Um, unfortunately, his, his daughter couldn't be here, but, um, you know, they, they genuinely reached out to me before I'd even offered it, asking if I had their contact details. Um, and that meant a lot to me, you know, because they were genuinely interested in not just hearing their story, but, you know, understanding more of what they went through on that day so that they could infuse that in, into their portrayal of, uh, portrayal of those characters. Um, so that's been fantastic. And even Creve meeting the long term veterans on Anzac Day at Wurrawan, you know, and meeting them on location uh, where we were about to start filming and hearing their reactions was um, absolutely fantastic. So I've been really pleasantly surprised about how easily our cast has bonded. Um, there's been, I can categorically say there's been no egos, you know, there's been no issues, there's been no drama. Um, everyone's just really rolled up their sleeves and just dived into the role. Um, continuous hours has, you know, helped us immensely, you know, with um, productivity and just keeping the momentum going every day on set. Um, but our incredible crew has really looked after those individuals, but um, it's been genuine mutual respect and, 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 and a genuine collaboration of every single person on, on the production. Wow, um, I am so proud of our production design team, our art department, scenic artists, props, you, you name it, vehicles. Um, I've never seen the level of 
depth of the production design on our film on an Australian film for maybe 20, 30 years. I mean, it, it is insanely incredible. I mean, you know, you're seeing 1966 toothbrushes, soap. Um, I mean, they went to the effort of getting the right, you know, Playboy magazine with the right date so that if some boffin picked it up on camera, um, they couldn't say, well, it's November, which would be after the battle because it was August 1966. Um, but I'm not just talking about that accuracy, I'm just talking the amount of props, you know, and the Nui Dat base, as, as you just mentioned, that was built in Narang. Um, we had some of the Long Tan veterans actually come and visit that, um, and it just blew them away. They were very emotional because they were instantly taken back. They said the smell, you know, the sounds, you know, the, the look of that Nui Dat base was so accurate, it actually overwhelmed them emotionally. Um, but in a good way, you know, because it was a little bit of closure, you know, for them because they were able to share it with some of their family, you know, who clearly weren't there. So, and I think that's had a really big impact on, um, you know, what audience is actually going to see on screen because the level of just background action, the level of background detail. I mean, we had 1966 bulldozer, you know, for six seconds in one scene in the background bulldozing a tree. Um, and you literally could see four or five layers of background, you know, in every shot. So um, that's something I, I just can't tell people, you know, how proud I am of Sam Hobbs, who, who's um, led production design, and, and Joni Weta, who's led our art department. Um, you know, they've painted the armoured personnel carriers and the choppers in period, you know, colours, accuracy has just been I incredible. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that has just blown my mind. I just haven't seen it, you know, for, for 20 to 30 years in, in a film like this. Yeah, yeah, well, we've actually, um, Australian Army's helped us immensely with the armoured personnel carriers, but we've actually had one of the armoured personnel carriers that was in the Battle of Long Tan, <laughs> which just blows people's mind, you know. Um, it's just been incredible to actually have that. So the APC that Adrian Roberts, who commanded the APCs that Stephen Peacock um, portrays, was actually in the Battle of Long Tan. So that's been amazing. Um, one of the enemy machine guns um, that Corporal, uh, sorry, that um, um, Jack Kirby, um, Company Sergeant Major Jack Kirby, uh, rushes out through the front lines and actually kills the enemy machine gun crew and then uses a grenade to put it out of action. Um, we've actually got that machine gun because it was captured in the battle and brought back to Australia and kept in a museum. Um, the One of the choppers, you know, one of the two Hueys, the UH-1Bs that was used in the Battle of Long, Long Tan is actually in our studio right now um, and is being used for the blue screen um, interior scenes within uh, one of the Hueys. So, um, to have that, you know, is just incredible. You know, to have that history actually ingrained in our film, um, you know, is, is just amazing. And the veterans, you know, see that, they appreciate it. I mean, when we were doing the artillery scenes, um, we actually had young Afghanistan and Iraq veterans manning the guns, you know. So, um, so it, it's just been incredible all around. I mean, the level of authenticity, detail, you know, um, attention to detail has just been incredible. Yeah, well, the best way I can describe it, describe it, because I've known Harry Smith, you know, for about 14 years. We actually served in the same unit, but, you know, 30 years apart. I'm not that old, but um, he, um, he, you know, because I've known Harry for so long, he's got this quiet fierceness, which Travis has as well. Um, you know, when I first watched, you know, I binge watched Vikings, so I could really get to know Travis um, uh, a lot better. Um, and he's a lot like Harry, you know, when he needs to be fierce, you know, he's fierce, but when he needs to be compassionate and fair, he's very compassionate and fair. Um, but ironically, um, I mean, whilst it was, you know, um, a, a very long time ago and it, was, and it was a brutal era, there was a professionalism, you know, around King Ragnar. Um, who Travis played and, and Harry and, and the role that he played, you know, with Delta Company because he came from special forces to regular infantry. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't for that background, everyone said, because Harry trained them to special forces levels, they definitely would not have survived the Battle of Long Tan. So, you know, so just Travis has that, you know, sort of in, in embodied within him, you know, that kind of... Um, you know, that quiet fierceness, but there's also that little bit of self-doubt, you know, there is that, 
occasional doubting, you know, the way that he portrayed um, King, King Ragnar Lothrock. So um, I couldn't imagine, you know, anyone else playing, playing Harry Smith. Um, I think when we, when we were doing our first two weeks at Wurrulan, um and 11 Platoon, we're filming 11 Platoon, you know, first contact with the enemy and having that first initial engagement, actually seeing the first two cast die was pretty, pretty emotional, you know. So, and, and, and it wasn't so much the, just the act of it, it was the way that, the way that they died. There was no Hollywood theatrics. There was no, you know, stunt wires. There was no nothing. They they literally, like what would happen in real life, just literally dropped to the ground, um, and it actually affected me for quite a quite a few days. You know, so that yeah, that that was, that was pretty tough. So yeah, we we've really tried to keep um, you know the essence of the story as truthful as possible. Um, but I have to remind the veterans that I've already done the painting, uh, sorry, the photograph. So my documentary is the photograph and the film is the painting. Um, so the documentary is accurate. Um, the film is, it, it, it's, it's the essence of the story um, and it's the essence of the characters and the essence of the, the you know, the Anzacs um, and uh, really respecting the enemy as well because, you know, the enemy, um, all the Australians that fought the battle have immense respect, you know, for the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, because to continuously charge into, you know, 24 artillery guns firing six to eight rounds a minute of artillery um, is pretty amazing. So um, we've always had a lot of respect, and it was an important um, um, objective for me not to demonise, you know, the, the, the former enemy, because I've been there, um, I've met them, um, they're incredibly accommodating and hospitable when I made my documentary. Um, and they were worried, you know, because unfortunately Hollywood's tended to, you know, demonise, you know, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, but um, ultimately it's like, you know, any conflict, there's always two sides and, um, and uh, yeah, we have a fantastic relationship with them now, so which is great.